Benvenuti. Buonasera, grazie. Buonasera. Buonasera a tutti. Ok, vedo che eh, Giulia Meli si è già collegata e anche Alessio Miolla. Sì, buonasera. Quindi manca, buonasera. Quindi manca, credo, eh, Scarpazza, che dovrebbe essere il terzo, il terzo relatore. No, no, ci sono. Ah, ecco, ah. buongiorno. Probabilmente non si visualizza il mio cognome, vedo. Eh, no, 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 infatti. Ah, ok, ci sono comunque. L'hai hanno trovato, perfetto. Va bene, io eh, non so esattamente come siano messi eh, i tempi rispetto alle presentazioni che c'erano prima, alle invitative talks, cioè se possiamo iniziare o se dobbiamo aspettare ancora un po' di tempo per lasciare la conclusione di quella sessione. Non so bene possiamo. come siamo messi in generale, insomma. Perfetto, grazie. Grazie, grazie. Allora, intanto mi presento, e io sono, sono Davide Crivelli, eh, sostituisco, eh, vediamo se solamente per una parte, e, e quindi riuscire a raggiungerci o per, o per questa sessione, la professoressa Michela Balconi. Eh, sono un ricercatore in Università Cattolica e lavoro appunto con, con la professoressa presso il suo centro eh, di ricerca internazionale. Um, però non voglio togliere in realtà tempo alle, alle relazioni, per cui eh, passerei di fatto la parola subito eh, a questo punto a Giulia Melis, alla dottoressa Giulia Melis, per la prima, per la prima presentazione di questa eh, sessione parallela. Mm. Eh, in effetti ho, ho dato per scontato che, eh, <ride> che l'introduzione fosse in italiano, ma è una mia assunzione. <ride> Perfetto, allora... Mi riavvolgo. Uh, hi everyone, uh, I am David Crivelli uh, from the Catholic University of uh, the Sacred Art in Milan. Um, I'm, I am here on behalf of uh, Professor Michela Balconi that uh, maybe, maybe she, she will be able to, to join us a bit later. Uh, for the moment, uh, she, she has been uh, captured by, by another uh, personal issue. Um, By the way, I, I don't want to uh, steal too much time to, to the talks, so I just, uh, uh, I just give the mic to um, uh, Giulia Melis for the first presentation that is uh, uh, titled uh, Eyewitnesses Evaluation, Should the Legal Criteria Be Adjusted Based on Scientific Results? Uh, please, Giulia, uh, you have about 20 minutes. Okay. Yes. Uh, let me share my screen. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And now you should be able to see my slide. It's correct. Absolutely. Okay. Good. Um, so good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Giulia Melis. I am a student. I came from uh, uh, the University of Padova. And today I'm here to talk about a witness's testimony in criminal trials and the criteria currently used for its evaluation. This is uh, uh, our agenda, and I'm going to start with uh, a brief introduction about uh, a witness's testimony. 
A witness's testimony is one of the most uh, crucial evidence in criminal trials, especially when it is uh, uh, the only available, and it is on that uh, that uh, uh, the direction of a judgment may depend. Um, the raising number of post-conviction DNA exoneration in the United States uh, highlighted the consequence of false uh, a witness's testimony. In fact, uh, more than 70% of all uh, um, unjust convictions were due to false uh, a witness's uh, uh, identification. Usually, the testimony of a witness is confirmed by external evidence, as the DNA or ticket plane, which verifies the accuracy of a witness, and this is called extrinsic reliability. But in cases where the veracity cannot be externally verified, uh, uh, judges' evaluation of the witness reliability is based on questionable criteria, derived from uh, the narrative characteristic of the testimony, and this is called intrinsic reliability. One of these uh, criteria proposed by uh, the US uh, Supreme Court is the confidence, which is the level of uh, certainty demonstrated by the witness at the confrontation. So it suggests that higher level of uh, expressed confidence are indicative of uh, uh, the accuracy of the statement. A second important criterion used by judges for the evaluation of the witness reliability is the exhaustiveness, which follows the principle that in order to be accurate, a testimony must contain sufficient amount of detail of uh, the event. Now, despite this criteria being used as a good approximation of accuracy, given the high stakes, uh, any uncertainties regarding the relationship between confidence or exhaustiveness and accuracy should be eliminated. Indeed, the proper relationship between accuracy and confidence has been much debated for years. On one hand, uh, several studies have found uh, a positive correlation, arguing that it is reasonable to deduce the accuracy of a statement from the confidence a witness display, in particular for shorter retention intervals, and when it comes to um, the recall of an event rather than the identification of a person, for example. On the other hand, other research suggests that uh, the two variables are independent from one another, and in particular that confidence can shift without affecting the accuracy of a statement, and that they are influenced by uh, external factors. Regarding the relationship uh, between exhaustiveness and accuracy, research have found that mock jurors are less likely to believe witnesses uh, that mention fewer details. But actually, um, good memory for details may not necessarily mean that uh, any witness remembers the crime accurately. Indeed, the people who remembered uh, fewer details made significantly more accurate uh, um, identification. Therefore, the point I want to start from is that it is important that the criteria by which a witness's reliability is evaluated in a courtroom are informed by actual uh, scientific research and not simply by common sense or intuition. With this assumption, uh, the current work sets out to investigate the uh, relationship between confidence or exhaustiveness with the accuracy of, a, of um, a witnesses. This is done conducing three completely independent uh, um, experiments by showing participants different video depicting crime scene. Uh, then they, are, they were asked to provide an immediate free recall and different recall after several hours uh, or days, and a rating of how confident they felt regarding their memories. At the end, we transcribed their statements and broke them down into different units of information in order to assess the confidence, exhaustiveness, and the relationship to accuracy. Accuracy refers to how accurate the reported unit of information are. Is the ratio of the correct items to the total items reported by the subject? So if, for example, a subject gives me five units of information, but only three are correct, the accuracy is 60%. Confidence uh, refers to how sure the confidence the, the witness is of uh, his statement, and uh, we're measuring it using a liquor scale, while exhaustiveness refers to the total number of units of information found uh, in the video, for example, uh, five, as uh, you can see in the image, and reported by the subject, in this case, uh, um, two. In the first experiment, uh, uh, participants were divided in uh, two groups, and a video showing a boy sexually arising a girl in a tube was shown to both groups. The first group was asked to provide an immediate uh, reminder after some minutes, after three weeks, and then after five weeks, while the second one provided the free recall only after three and five weeks. As I said, at each time point, the participants were also asked to rate how confident they felt regarding their memories. And during this analysis, the, the, the analysis, uh, we differentiate between uh, peripheral and central details. 
we ran uh, Spearman's raw correlation, and what we found is that there was no significant correlation between accuracy and confidence at each time point. And in addiction, correlation between accuracy and exhaustiveness were no significant, except for significant correlation between accuracy and exhaustiveness for central, but not peripheral details after five weeks. Moreover, immediate recall did not have an effect on participants' performance since the accuracy of the two groups uh, did not, did not uh, significantly uh, differ. While uh, in this second experiment, we asked to see a video depicting a robber uh, on a motorbike. And after viewing the video, uh, participants were asked to provide an immediate pre recall and to answer some questions. The control group was submitted to open semi structured question based on the information given during the first pre recall, while the experimental group is submitted to a structured interview, including uh, some suggested questions. Uh, then we also asked for um, another pre recall and after the interview, and another one uh, in. Um, in the 20 days follow-up. Also in this case, there was no significant correlation between accuracy and confidence, and also between accuracy and exhaustiveness of all participants at the first pre-recall. Now, since half of the subjects were affected by misleading information with a significant effect on accuracy, the two graphs uh, describe the control group result. As you can see in the central graph, there was no significant correlation between accuracy and confidence in the control group assessed at the two different time points, so at time two and time three. The same was found for exhaustiveness, except for a significant correlation only at time two. This indicates that the higher the total number of units of information participants reported after the semi-structured interview, so at time two, the height of the percentage of accuracy. However, no correlation was found at time zero and time three. So probably the relationship between accuracy and exhaustiveness is not as uh, straightforward um, as previously uh, assumed. In the last experiment, the third one, uh, we showed a, a video depicting a robber uh, in a shop to four groups uh, of subjects, uh, one of which was the control group. And then we asked for an immediate free recall and a rating of, of confidence. 24 hours later, we provided misleading information to all the participants except for the control group, and again, a free recall. Um, in brief, we found uh, the same results as the previous experiment, but this experiment also revealed that at follow-up, the accuracy is higher for the control group rather than for the other three groups um, that were exposed to um, the suggestive information. Moreover, we found uh, uh, for the control group that memories are affected by time and subjects tend to um, remember fewer details uh, at time one, so only after 24 hours uh, uh, watching the video. So um, in conclusion, the main finding is that uh, there is no association between uh, exhaustiveness, between um, a witness's confidence and accuracy of their statements. And our finding regarding the relationship between exhaustiveness and accuracy of the witnesses are not consistent. So confidence and, and the exhaustiveness of the witnesses should not be used as a proxy um, for determining the accuracy of a statement. The take home message we want to convey is that due to the importance of a witness's testimony and the evaluative criteria that I just introduced you, um, it is more likely that wrongful convictions are made. And this is a serious problem since the legal system's credibility collapses every time a wrongful conviction is, ma is made. And in addition to the fact that people who are innocent are being imprisoned while the real perpetrator is still at large. So this work uh, uh, suggests that common belief uh, um, should have no say in courtroom and juridical guidelines uh, should be updated by um, actual scientific research. So changing the criteria regarding the evaluation of the a witness's uh, uh, credibility will be one step uh, in the right direction uh, toward creating a juridical system that reflects the consensus on a witness's testimony within the scientific community. Thank you. Well, thank you, Julia. Uh, I think that we can just uh, move the question to uh, to the last part of this uh, of this session, so that all the speakers uh, could have at least enough time to present their words. Okay. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. So just keep your questions 
warm. <laughs> okay, um, then I, I just pass the mic to uh, Alessio Miolla, to Dr. Alessio Miolla, uh, who is presenting um, uh, a talk titled Words Lie, Your Face Doesn't. So please, Alessio. Thank you. You have Can you hear me and see my screen? Absolutely, absolutely. Okay. Okay, so you, you have your 10 minutes. <laughs> yep. So good evening to everyone. I'm uh, Alessio Miola, a PhD in brain, mind and computer science at the University of Padua. And tonight I'm going to present a study that merged the new cutting edge analysis of machine learning in the light detection field. And I would like to start by saying that we live nowadays in a world in which everything we do online is being watched, is being tracked, and every single action is carefully monitored and recorded. And the worst part in that is that we actually like and we are addicted in doing so. So we like tweet, we like share posts, and mostly we like share our feelings and emotions. So TikTok, for example, is one of the fastest growing social media platforms in the world, which allows users to, to share their own uh, short videos. And according to the latest statistics, 689 millions of people are monthly active users. And among them, 50% of them upload their own videos every day. And these videos usually display feelings, reactions, and the emotions of the users. However, these videos can convey genuine and authentic reaction, as well as pose of fake emotional facial expressions. So this study aims to implement an algorithm that can be a sort of kind of starting point for detecting genuine and pose emotional facial expressions displaying emotions. And this is actually even more true considering that people both untrained and uh, untrained observers and uh, also professional experts are completely unable to recognize deceit in emotional displays, especially if they have to rely on visual cues only. So several studies demonstrated that people tend to, tend to perform not, not for so far from the chance level when, when they ask to detect such behaviors. So we, to investigate this paradigm, we use we collect a huge data set containing almost 2,000 clips displaying genuine and posed emotions. Genuine emotions were collected uh, by using a multimodal elicitation protocol that aimed to trigger the six basic emotions to participants. Whereas for the fake counterparts, participants were explicitly asked to, to pose the emotions as naturally as possible. Then, the video and the, or the clips were preprocessed by means of open face, a face recognition uh, software based on deep neural network that allows to evaluate frame by frame the activation of 17 extra units of the face. And uses these metrics, we have extracted uh, features such as normalized mean or standard, um, standard deviation of the duration of the intensity of each extra units, or as well as uh, Shannon entropy and so other features for a total of 69 features. And we use these, um, these features in two main approaches. The first one that we call user independent, in which um, we try to detect in general, so for each emotion, and so regardless of the identity of the subjects, we, we try to uh, identify a common pattern that could discriminate genuine opposed emotions. To do so, we use um, a so-called leave one out nested cross-validation. So in other words, we use, for example, a subject one for testing and the others for the training. Then the training set was uh, within the training set we use a five-fold five cross-validation to optimize the models at tuning the hyperparameters and then was looped for each subject. So the next round, we use the second subject for the test and the first and the other for the training, then five, uh, five for cross validation again, and we repeat this process for each subject. So for the total number of subjects. 
And uh, this, uh, it's important to say that this, uh, this procedure was, um, was done for each emotion. So for each of the six basic emotions. And the results are the following. So for each emotion, the best model, according to the validation score was used. So in brief, we achieved 69% uh, of accuracy and 68% uh, of accuracy uh, for sadness and happiness respectively by using SVM linear. Um, it's called a support, a support vector machine, which is a linear supervised model. Then uh, decision three was revealed the best model for surprise, anger, and disgust with 78% uh, of accuracy on average. And uh, finally, random forest with 65% of accuracy it was the best model for to detect genuine and post fear. So as you can note, the percentages are not so high, are slightly better than, human, than humans. So we tried another approach because we hypothesized that the relatively low percentage of accuracy depending on the great variability among the subject expressions. So we tried to, to do, to run the same approach, but implementing a, an algorithm specific for each subject. So a kind of finger, fingerprint for each user. And we use the same approach. So um, in, the, in, in this case, instead of the subjects, all the clips within the subject were used. So for example, in, in the, um, the outer loop, which is the, called the nested loop, we use the first clip, let's say the first clip for testing and the other one for training. And inside the training, we use an inner, inner loop like before by using a um, five-fold cross-validation. And then the same procedure was repeated for the second clip, third clip, and so on for the, the number of uh, clips collected for the subject. So in other words, if for the same subject, we had four, uh, 40 clips, we looped the training 40 times. It's important also to, to specify that we use all the clips of the subjects regardless, regardless of the emotions expressed. So we mix all the emotions and we did not differentiate uh, the algorithm like the first approach. And actually the, the results increase a lot because um, by using only one model, support vector machine with a kernel filter, we achieved uh, an average of 77% of accuracy. However, we note that the percentage of accuracy increased according to the number of users clips, reaching up to 84% for the users that had more than 35 clips. So more clips we have of the subject, more accurate is our model. So to sum up, we saw uh, by using machine learning models, we outperform the uh, accuracy level of humans in the emotional light detection. And by saying that, I'm not claiming that these models could be applied today because there are several limitations, um, mainly about the generalization of these results. However, these results might invite all of us at least to reflect on the amount of, of information that we agree to share every day and which importance is often neglected. And um, because maybe not today, neither tomorrow, but in not too far, not too distant future, this data can be used for or against, against us. And um, thank you for your, your attention. Okay, thank you, Alessio. And now we can move to uh, the last talk, uh, which will be presented by uh, Cristina Scarpazza. Yes. Oh, okay, <laughs> there yes. you are. So, okay, you, you have the mic now. Uh, this this yes. talk is titled uh, Different Neural Substrate in Developmental and Acquired uh, Pedophilia preliminary results. Okay, okay thank so you for the you have, you have your You have your 10 minutes. Yes, thank you. So these results are not preliminary anymore because of course the title is now one year old. So maybe not all of you know that 
pedophilia is not a unified uh, construct. So we do have mainly two forms of pedophilia called idiopathic or developmental pedophilia and acquired pedophilia. Uh, two, these two forms of pedophilia are very different from many point of view. First of all, in their nature, so idiopathic pedophilia is a psychiatric condition included within the DSM-5 uh, under the section of paraphilias. On the contrary, acquired pedophilia is a neurological uh, disorder. So acquired pedophilia is a symptom emerging uh, within the context of a neurological disorder. So the etiology of the two forms of pedophilia are widely different. The etiology of idiopathic pedophilia is multifactorial. Uh, so there is, of course, a, a, like a, genetic a genetic predisposition. And then, but we also have the influence of environment. We also have the, inf the influence of hormones and so on. On the contrary, the etiology of acquired pedophilia is monofactorial. So is the neurological condition underlying the symptoms insurgence. In each individual, the etiology, of course, could, could differ. Uh, in cases where acquired pedophilia surge like, as a consequence of um, uh, frontotemporal dementia, the etiology is degenerative disorder, um, but the etiology could also be traumatic or um, ischemic. Another difference is the possible therapies. So as idiopathic pedophilia is the main disorder per se, then the therapies for idiopathic pedophilia should treat pedophilia itself. On the contrary, acquired pedophilia is not the disorder that, that needs to be treated, it's only a symptom. So if you want to treat acquired pedophilia, you need to treat the underlying neurological condition. For instance, we have cases where uh, pedophilia is surge as a consequence of a brain tumor. So if you want acquired pedophilia to receive it, you need to, uh, to surgically remove the brain tumor causing this symptom. Finally, the two forms of pedophilia are very different in the modus operandi. While idiopathic pedophiles apply a predatory modus operandi, so they actively look for victims, um, the modus operandi of acquired pedophiles is called impulsive. So they do not actively look for victims, but they do act impulsively when they found uh, children. In this work in 2009 and 19, uh, basically we uh, observe that uh, that uh, idiopathic uh, that acquired pedophiles and idiopathic pedophiles are widely different in these numbers, and these numbers basically reflect what we found. Uh, in the literature, doing a systematic liter literature search on acquired pedophilia, and what we found uh, as a red flag, so symptoms uh, like suggestions of um, acquired pedophilia. So we identified six red flags of acquired pedophilic behavior that can be so summarized as, as follows. So we have two red flags that are uh, that mean an acquired origin so if the offender age is uh, higher than uh, 50 then it is more likely that, that, that the acquired uh, that the disorder is acquired and again if uh, there are no previous criminal sex offenses then uh, it is more likely that this behavior is acquired we have other two red flags that uh, that reflect impulse discontrol. So the absence of masking and the absence of premeditation. So these offenders usually do not try to mask their behavior and do not premeditate their behavior. Uh, contrary to, uh, to offenders with idiopathic pedophilia that they of course premeditate a lot um, given the predatory modus operandi. Finally, the last two red flags uh, involves a preserved moral judgment, as these uh, individuals usually provide a spontaneous confession and have a, a sense of guilt, indicating that, that usually they have a spared um, moral judgment, even if this data is more complicated because we followed many uh, patients with acquired pedophilia that where moral judgment was impaired as well. 
So after finding, uh, after we found these six red flag, we try. Our next question was: um, Are the brain pathologies underlying the two different forms of pedophilia comparable? So of course, idiopathic pedophilia is a psychiatric condition, and so it does not have evident neural basis. On the contrary, acquired pedophilia is a neurological condition, so the, there are clear brain alteration. But our question was more specific. So as research supported the idea that even psychiatric conditions are characterized by subtle brain abnormalities, are the one present in idiopathic pedophilia in the same region of the brain lesion causing um, acquired pedophilia? So can idiopathic and acquired pedophilia uh, be explained by the alteration of this very same brain region? So of course, to, uh, to find an answer to this question, we could not apply the two pathologies because they are widely different. So to uh, understand uh, whether um, defendant with idiopathic pedophilia have a um, common brain a common brain alteration. We run a meta analysis of previous neuroimaging findings on idiopathic pedophilia. Um, neuro, in, in this case, we run the um, activation likelihood estimation meta analysis that basically try to find convergent findings between, especially convergent findings between uh, different studies. So let's imagine that each of, of, of these spheres represent one coordinate reported in one specific findings. The result of the meta-analysis will be this one. So where different findings converge, especially within the brain. So we found 19 papers uh, studying the neural basis of idiopathic pedophiles. We uh, run neuroimaging meta coordinate based meta-analysis on these findings, and we found that the absence of significant convergent and consistent findings in idiopathic pedophiles. So every study reporting the, 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 the existence of brain alteration in idiopathic pedophiles basically reported different results from the other studies. So the, the results of this study did not converge in one single brain region. So basically, uh, we fail in to support the existence of a common neural basis of a consistent neural basis for idiopathic pedophilia. But what emerged in acquired pedophilia? Here we have to apply the lesion network approach. Why is that? Because we observe that the brain lesion causing acquired, uh, acquired pedophilia are spatially heterogeneous. So these are um, some examples. So pedophilia, acquired pedophilia can emerge as a consequence of uh, orbitofrontal cortex lesion, hippocampal lesion, putamen lesion, and uh, uh, like uh, the encephalic lesion, hippocampal lesion again. So we ask ourselves, why this, uh, this patient with so different, so heterogeneous uh, lesion, all of them manifested the same symptom, which is pedophilia? So what we apply the uh, the uh, lesion network approach. This uh, this um, approach is based on the neuroscientific evidence that a brain region is not working isolated, but each brain region is part of a functionally connected and complex brain network of brain region that work jointly, so that the impairment of one brain region also impact on the functioning of the whole network. So basically what I did is that I manually traced the brain lesion of the patient with acquired pedophilia, and I calculated using a specific brain imaging technique called uh, seed-based connectivity, um, resting, state, resting state connectivity. I calculated the brain region functionally connected with the lesion of each patient. So this is the lesion of my patient. This is the brain network functionally connected with the lesion. So I end up with 24 different network involved in, 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 the, 24, uh, in the 24 different patients with acquired pedophilia. So to answer my question, so which is the, 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 the neural network involved, consistently involved in acquired pedophilia, I basically calculated the overlap 
the overlap between these different 24 network, the, the 24 individual networks. And what I found is this one. So through, uh, although the individual lesion at different location in different patients, the lesion network mark, ma mapping analysis revealed that 95% of them were part of a single brain network defined by functional connectivity with posterior midline uh, mid structure, including, as you can see here, the pre precuneus and posterior cingulate cortex and the orbitofrontal, uh, bilateral orbitofrontal cortex. But which is the meaning of this uh, region? To understand this last question, I applied a, a, a technique called um, a technique called a functional characterization or also behavioral profiling. So this technique allowed to topographically define brain region with the corresponding psychological process. So this approach capitalized on a huge database called Brain Map, where all the literature, all the results from the existing literature is summarized. So starting from the coordinate that I obtained, I was able to map this coordinate and to understand in the general literature, which are the cognitive functions subserved by this region. And what I found is that the orbitofrontal cortex uh, so, uh, sorry, that the posterior midline region, like the percuneus and posterior cingulate cortex, are, are related to the social cognition and in particular to theory of mind, while the right orbitofrontal cortex is related to action inhibition. These are the, the, the most important findings. Finally, uh, so here we can see that we have action inhibition and theory of mind that are jointly involved in acquired pedophilia that and are not involved in, uh, in uh, idiopathic pedophilia. As you can see, action inhibition and theory of mind and social cognition are two function, cognitive functions that are really important for insanity evaluation because they, they are the, the cognitive function subserving the uh, ability to understand, uh, the, um, to understand and the ability to will, to want. Uh, it's also important to note that these results are also confirmed by existing literature. So I also run a meta-analysis on cognitive function um, that are um, involved in idiopathic, idiopathic and acquired pedophilia. In idiopathic pedophilia, we can, we can see from these meta-analysis that idiopathic pedophiles do not have empathy deficit, do not have action inhibition deficit, do not have planning deficit. On the contrary, um, acquired pedophiles in half, half of the patients with acquired pedophilia have an, an impaired uh, social cognition and all of them, so 96% of them have an impaired inhibition, inhibition ability. So to, to conclude, idiopathic pedophilia has no cognitive deficit in cognitive function relevant to insanity, and there are no brain impairment in brain region potentially relevant for insanity. So this is the reason why idiopathic pedophilia is not relevant for insanity. Different is the case of acquired pedophilia, because individuals with acquired pedophilia have cognitive deficit relevant for insanity, like deficit in action inhibition and in social cognition. And uh, they also have congruent lesion in brain region potentially relevant for insanity. So acquired pedophilia is potentially relevant for insanity, but of course, a case, a case by case approach should always be used. So the, the take home messages for today are the following. Idiopathic and acquired pedophilia differs in nature, etiology, neural basis therapy, and modus operandi. There are six red flags from literature uh, that have, have been proposed to uh, allow a profiling of acquired pedophiles. Acquired pedophilia localized to a brain network involving, involving the orbitofrontal cortex and posterior midline structure. And this brain region subserve cognitive function relevant for insanity. And that's all. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Christina. So now it's time for questions. 
Should any one of you have one or more questions, just please take a lead. Well, uh, I, I think I'll just start just to see if, if anyone else will follow. Um, well, I've, I have a couple of questions. Uh, indeed, one for uh, Christina and one for Alessio in particular. Uh, the first one is, well, well first of all, um, uh, just, I mean, for, for all of you, uh, great presentations uh, and great talks, all of them uh, dealing with really uh, relevant and, and salient uh, topics. So just thank you. Mm, so having said that, uh, my first question is, uh, what about connectivity in idiopathic uh, pedophilia? Because may maybe I missed it, uh, but uh, Christina, you, you were talking about um, uh, interesting results about, about connectivity. I mean, uh, well, functional, can, can we say connectivity mm -hmm. in, in acquired one? But what about the, uh, the idiopathic one? Because, because that, that that kind of, of clinical picture seems to me a bit more uh, uh, vague. I mean, in, in their neurofunctional correlates. Uh, yes, of course. So um, in, it depends on what you mean. What do you mean with connectivity? Mm -hmm. So because we have different te techniques to analyze functional connectivity, of course. Yeah, sure. So in the case of acquired pedophilia, we use the, the lesion like a seed, and we calculated the connectivity between the seed and the rest of the brain. But the point is, uh, which kind of connectivity would we have to calculate with, in the case of idiopathic pedoph pedophilia, we do not have any clear brain lesion to calculate the connectivity with. So there are, of course, other techniques to calculate connectivity. We can uh, use functional connectivity to calculate connectivity between two a priori selected region, or, or we can use graph analysis to calculate the connectivity between each brain region and every other brain region. Exactly. Uh, or, or Granger also, or also Granger causality, for example, on, yeah, yeah, on the full network and resting states data. So uh, I'm not aware of any uh, paper reporting this kind of uh, or studies. In idiopathic pedophilia, so far, only structural or uh, task-related um, results have been, uh, uh, have been published. So okay. as far as I know, there are no studies published on this topic yet. Okay, thank you. Welcome. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, okay. Oh, uh, I see that we we have a couple of questions from uh, Francesco Stocchi. So I will just give my second one for, <laughs> and if we still have time. Hi everyone. Uh, thank you for the uh, the lectures. They were very interesting. I have a question for Alessio Miolla and one for uh, uh, Dr. Scarpazza. Um, the first one, um, if um, the, per the, per the percentage of uh, accuracy of the facial recognition can change uh, if the subjects that you use for your data set are, uh, um, are trained to act, for example, to act in a, um, so are like uh, real life actors, for example, it can change uh, or the IE can uh, um, differentiate uh, um, normal normal people and actors. It's, and okay, I, I, I think that I got your yeah. question, and um, I think that is really interesting because uh, actors usually. Um, by using, uh, it's called uh, Stanislavski method, they are able to uh, revive and uh, re-experience the emotion like it, it was real. So it's, it's, good. it's actually a good question, but I cannot answer you because it, it's just the first of the following studies, but okay. um, I'm sure that we are going to try with the, to challenge more our algorithm. But it's a really good question. We thought about it, but for the first study, I think that it's going to be okay just to 
use it and try the model with the healthy and normal people. But thank you for the uh, for this question. Uh, you're right. You're right. Thank you for your answer. And the second question is um, uh, on the acquired pedophilia. Uh, how many cases do we have in literature of acquired pedophilia? Because I studied for my thesis uh, uh, legal cases, uh, the, the Dr. Mattiello case. Um, That's one I followed personally. Yeah. And uh, I'm, I, I found uh, a lot of comments on the sentence and uh, that, that states that there is like uh, very few case of, cases of uh, acquired pedophilia. And uh, I, th I think that it's kind of problematic to translate uh, the knowledge uh, derived from uh, these kind of neuroscience experiments uh, into the legal field because sometimes it's, it's difficult to prove the, um, the, the connection between uh, the, um, the state of the, of the brain of the, of the subject and uh, the, the action that they perform. Yes, so that's an extremely good question. So uh, we have so far 24 cases of acquired pedophilia reported in the literature. But uh, sometimes literature do not provide a good overview of what we know. Mm -hmm. So what I did uh, two years ago with uh, one of my students, I was very lucky because uh, this student of mine was the daughter of a judge here yeah, in the north of Italy. So we had the opportunity to uh, a judge of the preliminary investigation. So uh, Giudice delle Indagini Preliminari okay, for okay. the time. So we had the opportunity to see a lot of uh, papers of different cases of pedophilia that mm -hmm. did not arrive to the, to, to, the first, uh, to the first degree because they were already stopped in the preliminary investigation. So we had a lot of cases of very old individuals, like 80 plus individuals, mm -hmm. uh, doing um, this kind of, be uh, acting this kind of behaviors. And the judges recognized that something was wrong and that these behaviors were due to dementia. So, I mean, it, it is our okay. opinion that acquired pedophilia is more frequent than, than we know from the literature, from the, from this, from the scientific literature. And you, you, also, you also have to keep in mind that um, you need to evaluate whether the defendant manifested or not a behavioral fracture between how he, he was behaving before and how he was behaving half after the brain lesion of the or the neurological insurgence. So sometimes I, I'm asked by students whether this kind, these people were maybe pedophiles even before, but they decided not to act their behavior. I mean, probably this is likely, I don't know. We will never have the right answer to this question. But the point is that for the legal point of view, what we need to evaluate, to, to, to judge is their behavior. So we, we, in any case, we have an individual that was able to inhibit his urges before and was not able to inhibit the urges uh, after the lesion. So something happened there. Okay. Thank you for the answer. But if you are interested to this case, uh, so I know about the, the, the comment to the, to the sentence that uh, was done for, for the case of Mattiello, we replied. Uh, there is also a comment in a scientific paper, uh, a scientific journal, Neuroethics, and we also replied because it was full of, of uh, very uh, relevant errors. So if you are interested, just uh, let me know and I will send you yeah. the... Can, um, can I uh, contact you later and uh, with me because I'm doing my PhD project on these uh, subjects, so I'm really interested. Okay. Thank you. So yeah, so please contact me because I'm trying to. Thank you to very much. Great, thanks. So I I would just. Uh, Try my, my my second my second question. Uh, well, it's just a curiosity, more more than a question. Uh, 
it was for for Alessio Miola, and uh, it has to do with the the, uh, the differences that you observed across modeling methods in the um, uh, user independent uh, data analysis. But I mean, it's just my my, my lack of knowledge. I, I have to admit it in in that in that direction. Uh, so if you just could please add some uh, thoughts about about why uh, different, um, uh, let's say, emotional patterns, I mean, mimic patterns, uh, was better captured by different models. Uh, if you if you have an answer, of course. Yeah, because uh, we tried different models, but we selected all uh, only the models the, in which the validation score was higher because it's a rule too, because um, more is your much higher is your validation score, more generalized could be your results. So basically we select according to the validation score. And we tried, um, I mean, uh, the, the percentage of accuracy are not stable across the models because each model has own logic, so mathematical logic. And of course, um, um, basically, um, we use only supervised models just to okay. give an interpretation of the results. And I think that um, according to the complexity of the, of the expression uh, uh, display, some models can work better. So, okay. for example, for fear, uh, we use a random forest, which is the most complex model compared to the other ones, but we achieved only 65% in the user um, independent. So I think that according to the complexity, uh, uh, also about the variability about uh, among the subject uh, display, we obtain different percentage of accuracies. And, um, and it, uh, quite interesting because in the other approach, we only used one model. We selected only one model in which the percentage were, were stable across all the subjects, uh, across all the emotions. So um, I think that our uh, the first approach was affected severely by the different in the expression of genuine um, and the fake uh, emotions among all the subjects. I don't know if I... Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely, mm -hmm. absolutely. So it's, it, uh, if I can try to, to, to summarize, uh, it, it, but it also depends on the uh, variability, I mean, on, on the complexity and therefore also the, the variability uh, among different expressions, uh, even if they, mm, but we, we can say refer to the same uh, emotion. Yeah, because if, for if, example, uh, SVM use a linear regression, mm -hmm. uh, dichotomic regression, so, but, mm, whereas random forest use more complex uh, okay. regression so as you can note uh, you probably know um, the the complex of the model depends on also um, uh, is probably more complex in some probably yeah because I, I am wondering how about uh, the implications and the possible mathematical explanations but I think that um, some models are more biased it's called bias uh, by the logic behind the, uh, the data. So basically okay. some models work better for high level hierarchical complex data and some models work better for easier, uh, less structured data. So it's hard to, to explain it perfectly because machine learning is like a dark box even if the, the models and the data are interpretable. So yeah, um, sure. I cannot say that, but I presume that it's because of this, this reason, this motivation. But thank you for the, okay, thank you. For the question. <laughs> thank, thank you for the honesty and the clarity. <laughs> 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 okay, so, uh, well, I don't know if there are any other questions from, from the audience. Okay.
Okay, so, well, I think that we can uh, conclude this, uh, this session. Uh, once again, thanks, many thanks to, uh, to all of the speakers and also to all of the persons that, that behind them <laughs> collaborated with them with, for, for creating all those uh, beautiful data and, and talks that they presented us uh, today. Um, I think that now there will be a small break. It, it's, it's correct, Francesca? Yes, it's correct, yes. Okay, great, great. So uh, we will then uh, move to, to, to the main hall for, uh, um, uh, for, for, for the next lecture, for the next senior lecture. Thank you so much. Okay, great. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you all. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.